we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone to Virtual Global Spine. I'm Wendy Gibbs, and we are very fortunate today to be joined by our friend Nader Dadalit from Northwestern. We're so excited to have him back. I'm also joined by co-host Ali Baj, and hopefully soon, our other co-hosts, John Shin, Koi Tan, and John Rizzuli. We have a lot of great information though today, so I don't want to waste any more time. Let's go ahead and get started. Nader, do you want to share your screen and show us your cases? Absolutely. Thank you guys for having me. This has been a Fantastic conference, to be honest. I was just talking to my uh, colleagues, uh, Wendy and Ali, how beautiful uh, the conference is put together. And uh, there's a lot of work behind the scenes. So thank you uh, for doing it and for inviting me. Uh, let me see. This is the... Uh, um, uh, let's, let's do this. And uh, let's go up here. Okay. I have a few cases. We'll, we'll, I'll probably have half an hour to present. So um, uh, today we'll be talking about a few uh, cranial vitreal junction cases. Not all of them are quite complex, but um, they're pretty different. Um, try to made, uh, put together a variety of cases, infectious, uh, congenital, and traumatic. We'll start with this one. This is a patient who uh, was 45 years old, presented to the ER with upper neck pain and fevers. On exam, he was neurologically normal, and he was, uh, had a history of IV drug abuse. Uh, now, obviously, because he was, had a fever, uh, they, they, they um, drew some blood cultures and did a fever workup, which included imaging as well, since he had upper neck pain, they imaged the cervical spine, and uh, the blood cultures ultimately uh, grew staph aureus. So uh, th these, these are a couple of uh, sagittal uh, MR scans. Uh, T2 on the left side and on the right side, a sagittal T1 with contrast. So um, definitely I'm going to have uh, uh, Dr. Gibbs here uh, make some comments uh, on what we see here. Okay. So, yeah, you have your sagittal T2, and I, I can't use my mouse, but up at the C2 level, you have abnormal signal within the bone marrow there. So increased... T2 signal, you also have a lot of soft tissue in front of C2, between C2 and C1, predental space. On your post-contrast image, avid enhancement. So the, the body itself, you can't tell as much, but it is abnormal, C2, and then that enhancing soft tissue where you're pointing, and then, yes, in front of that too, a lot of prevertebral um, soft tissue enhancement. It doesn't look like any cord enhancement and, or any epidural on this slice, but... There's a little, maybe a little collection there too. Okay, um, so at this point, uh, what would be the differential diagnosis uh, based on these two uh, parasagittal uh, cuts? Ali gets to play too. No, I, I missed the beginning. Did you say they were being, they're being worked up for infection, right? That's what you said? Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's a patient has fevers, uh, you know, they drew blood cultures, ultimately uh, they groom uh, staph aureus. Uh, history of IV drug abuse as well. Neurologically intact, given the images, but but the patient uh, yeah, that's was yeah. intact. So that's one thing that you don't have any. You have cord compression, but no cord signal abnormality too. That's what we didn't mention before at the craniosacral junction there. So this Correct. is interesting because there's no disc abnormality when we think of infection. We think discitis, osteomyelitis. You don't have any disc abnormality here, so it's not discitis. But you do have that that. Um, probably, you know, a synovial enhancement. You said it's infection, so it's got to be infection. We could have also said maybe inflammatory, but probably not that much prevertebral enhancement if it was inflammatory yeah. or anything else. Mm -hmm. And we can see definitely the ADI here is increased if you kind of look uh, closely. Now, this is the CAT scan that was also uh, obtained at the, uh, at the index uh, presentation the, the same day he presented. That's a uh, uh, CT of the neck, uh, uh, CTA of the neck, and uh, kind of see similar findings, but definitely we get, gives us more details on what ha what's happening to the bony structures. Increased mm -hmm. ADI here, involvement of C2 here, and definitely involvement of uh, the condyle C1 and also C2 uh, facet. We can see a little bit of the subluxation here bilaterally. So this patient was admitted to internal medicine, 
okay, we were not consulted, uh, a different service was consulted. And they said, okay, it has a little bit of probably instability, probably that's infectious in etiology uh, with the uh, prevertebral uh, collection, a retroodontoid collection too on that, on that MR. And they managed them with vancomycin uh, IV, as well as I placed on a Miami J color, so rigid color and uh, a vancomycin IV. He symptomatically, he was not ambulating much because of pain. Whenever he stands up, he'll have pain. Uh, but his pain was improving when he's uh, laying down. And, um, and they repeated the scan. Dr. Dottoli, sorry, yes. I'm going to interrupt you for a second. Um, yeah. You said this patient uh, was admitted to medicine, caller, and uh, they did not reach out to you, correct? Yeah, a different service was on call, sure. so it was not neurosurgery. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in your opinion before you show us what happened to the patient, because I have a feeling I know what happened. But let's say, let's say you were involved at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, would you have done anything differently besides what they did? Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, the ADI is pretty concerning. There's a subluxation ventrally. This is an unstable situation. I wouldn't be liberal in mobilizing a patient with, uh, with a Miami J color. There's absolutely, I mean, there's a lot of evidence of uh, uh, instability, at least at C1, C2, you know what I mean? At this point, although you have the occipital condyle involved, but you know, the joint here, uh, there's, it's, it's uh, still intact, well aligned on both sides. So at this point, um, I would have done something, maybe uh, stabilize him from the back once he's medically ready, but I would have mobilized him. I would not have mobilized him because, you know, the first question is, is this situation uh, a situation of uh, instability, biomechanical instability? And the answer is yes. He has an elevated ADI. He has subluxation of the C1, C2 facets on both sides. And uh, the inflammation is involving definitely all the ligaments, all the structures, the soft tissue structures around the, uh, around the, uh, 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 around the cranvertebral junction. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of evidence of, uh, uh, that there is instability that needs to be addressed uh, surgically, uh, you know, and then there's like already narrowing at the, at the upper cervical spine in terms of uh, canal stenosis. So, uh, no, I, absolutely, I would have intervened differently. That's why I had to admit that, you know, tell you the whole story. So, so would you agree with this, uh, uh, Ali, uh, in terms of uh, intervening at this point, or what would you have done? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, I mean, I just uh, I'm, I'm on the same page with you. When you see something that appears to be, you know, a lytic destructive process that is acute and concurrent subluxation and stability, you know, the natural history is not going to be good. If this patient presented in a delayed fashion with something, whatever it is, has cooled off treated okay maybe you can talk about non-operative but this is uh, this is a an acute bad process early on in the management of this patient and so the trajectory for me doesn't look good here for non-surgical options mm -hmm. absolutely so uh, you know it, it's it's good also to learn from about the natural history as you mentioned uh, although the natural is not good but but to kind of confirm that you got to intervene early when, whenever you recognize Acute instability, acute instability. Uh, uh, th this this case uh, demonst demonstrates that uh, the necessity of intervention acutely. So he was mobilized. A repeat um, uh, CT was done uh, a week later. And uh, what do we see here? I get. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yay! So you, now you do have. Looks like on this last image back here you're starting to get more involvement of the um, occipital condyle on that side, right? Is that now involved? Correct. This other side is still okay, but this side, whichever side this is, is worse. Yeah, I should have switched it to here. Yeah, that's the same side that was there, but, uh, but yeah, it's con oh. you know, continuous involvement of condyle, C2, C1. And, and more, yeah, and more subluxation, more compression of the, mm. the upper cord there. So at that point, the patient uh, definitely... Um, was starting to have more symptoms, but mostly those symptoms were uh, numbness in the upper extremities and also uh, dysarthria, like uh, uh, dysarthria and dysphonia uh, at, that, at that stage. So that's a week later. So the next day after that scan was done, he was, he was working with physical therapy. Two days after that uh, CT was done, he was working with physical therapy up and about with a Miami J collar nice and tight. He started compl complaining of severe uh, excruciating neck pain, 
torticollis, and then worsening this arthria, dysphonia, and dysphagia. His motor exam abruptly worsened uh, to become one out of five in the upper extremities and two out of five in the lower extremities. So at that point, we were consulted. So um, now, definitely with, with a change in the neurological exam like this, you want to investigate that. So they uh, placed him back, bed rest, and uh, kept him in my color, and they obtained a CT scan. So that's the scout of the, of the CAT scan, uh, how it looks like. And what jumps out here, you know, I should have taken a picture of the patient, but this is like the, health, the head is uh, turned to one side and it tilted. So this is what we call a cock robin head uh, position, almost pathognomonic of uh, C1, C2 rotatory subluxation. So whenever you see a patient's head like this, that's a C1, C2 subluxation. Acute or chronic, it doesn't matter, but like that's all, always almost pathognomonic of, of this condition. And uh, when you see a C1, C2 sublux, rotatory subluxation in the setting of an infection, it, 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 uh, it uh, amounts to the what we call a Grisel syndrome, we, which we always see more commonly in uh, the pediatric population. Uh, you know, C1, C2 rotatory subluxation and the setting of an infection, uh, usually a retropharyngeal abscess. So that's the CAT scan now, obviously. You can see now the anatomy is definitely disrupted because now you got to think about it in 3D. Um, and, you know, if you want to make a comment, uh, uh, Wendy, on, on what we see here. Yeah, I don't even know what to say now. You've got very, yeah, your C2 is just dissolving there too. Yes, yeah. You're, you don't, you're not going to have any bone left there. How, so long that's all that how long how, how much time it passed? It's about eight, nine days since the, in, uh, since the first scan. So, you know, IV antibiotics, Miami J color, but, uh, but he was, um, you know, his activity was as tolerated. And you can see here, that's the, uh, uh, the uh, Framen Magnum right here. And you can see here's the Ophistheon. Uh, and uh, it's, it's rotated. So this is, this is a totally rotated uh, along with C1 over C2, subluxed forward two uh, as well. And there's a significant deformity at the current vertebral junction. And you can see definitely it explains the symptoms. That's why the patients squeak in the upper and lower extremities. It's what we call a form of uh, cruciate paralysis cruciate paralysis, which is the uh, central cord, if, if, you, if you will, of the upper cervical spine, because it includes, you know, uh, cranial nerve uh, deficits as well, because the nuclei are compressed and it, it includes uh, dysphagia, dysphonia, and um, beyond just uh, upper and lower extremity uh, weakness. So obviously we're consulted here, like, yeah, we need to do emergent surgery, this patient has a deficit. So what would we do in this situation? I mean, are we going to take this patient uh, and perform an operation on him with this, with this deformity? Or what should we do that we can help improve the deformity and reduce it to what it's supposed to look like uh, as normal as of anatomy as we can, uh, as can be? So what, any suggestions on what to do next with this patient? Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll also pull the audience and, and see what, uh, what uh, our participants think. Uh, but while we get some responses, uh, Nader, I, I, you know, I think every, literally every single case for me, it's, I tell people spine surgery is really easy. Don't make sure, you know, don't give away our secret. We only do three things. We realign, decompress, and stabilize. So only three things we do. Sometimes we do one of them, sometimes we do two, and sometimes we do all three. And in my opinion, this, this is a patient that needs all three. Uh, and you just have to, you know, decide on how you uh, can safely and expeditiously uh, provide treatment for this patient. But uh, urgent decompression or at least decompression by realignment is going to be very important here. Absolutely. What about John Shin? I know John just was distracted. Somebody was asking him a question, but he might still, he can multitask. So. Yeah, that's right. Hey, guys. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Um, there he is, Dr. Shin. Welcome. Yeah, I, uh, I I feel like I need some education here to learn from the masters, you know. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, those are great points. Wow, what a tough case. So uh, so how would you reduce this? Like, like let's say I'm just imagining our PGY2, PGY3, 
you know, after they've wet themselves, I'm trying to think, you know, like, how would you, what do you do? You put them in a, you do it at the bedside, you bring them to the OR nodder, like, what's your strategy here? So, you know, that's, you know, the thing is, by, by the bedside, the reason, for many reasons, the thing is, like, we know the patient's deficit is due to the deformity, you know, it's not like due to, like, an epidural abscess pushing on the spinal cord, it's just because of this deformity. So as long as we reduce them expeditiously, we already decompressed the spinal cord. You know, obviously taking him to the operating room right now with this cock and head rotated to the side um, uh, and fusing him inside too is not a good idea. But since it's an abrupt change, so it should be easy to reduce. You know what I mean? So if, let's say if there's a patient who has a chronic deformity, these are more challenging to reduce uh, than acute deformities like this with everything's loose around the uh, spinal cord. So right away, you know, the, we were called, they said they've added him on for like surgery. I said, no, let's cancel the surgery. Let's put him in traction and try to reduce the, uh, uh, the alignment at the CVJ uh, with traction and see if that works. So, and that's like, the, that's the, uh, what's supposed to be a coronal view. Uh, and you can see that the head is totally rotated. That's like sagittal here, coronal here. Um, that's another view of the uh, pre-reduction, obviously, a rotatory subluxation. You know, sometimes with these big deformities, uh, you know, you'd understand them more with a, a 3D reconstruction. But here we knew that from the previous scans, what, what the progression of what happened. So we, we knew it's a rotatory subluxation. We didn't have to kind of reconstruct the 3D. And that's the MR that was taken. You can see extensive destruction uh, of the C1, C2, uh, see the prevertebral uh, phlegmon here and a significant compression at the, at the upper cervical spine because of the subluxation. That's the anterior arch here. That's the posterior arch here. So a lot of subluxation. So place some traction, 20 pounds, you know, and I like to use, instead of Gardner-Wells tongs, uh, crown halo traction, bivector traction gives you more control. And... Uh, you know, usually for CVG uh, pathology, especially acute, I don't go more than 15 to 20 pounds. And you can see his head aligned nicely. He was cock robin, he was rotated to the side. And um, as soon as that was done, two hours later, he started getting better in terms of neurological uh, compromise. So his upper extremity function improved, you know, and it became less of an emergency because we realigned the spine then it becomes less of a rear because with realignment, you decompress. So that's how it looked like. And um, uh, the traction, if anyone has any question about on how to put patients in traction, I'm sure everyone knows how to do that. But uh, uh, mid pupillary aligning intersecting with the uh, equator and then in the prior to occipital area, you want to avoid the uh, sinuses and uh, you apply uh, the traction. Inadar, are you uh, are you doing this on the floor or like on a telemetry bed, ICU? I'm just curious regarding... ICU. This guy was has a deficit. We need to definitely keep his mean arterial pressures adequate. Uh, you know, we're treating him like a spinal cord injury. So in the ICU. So that's the ICU setting. And do you, uh, see, do you see this? How do you think of this uh, like being different from, like, say, like traumatic, uh, like atlanto-occipital dislocation? You know, because uh, it looks... Mm -hmm. Biomechanically, it seems pretty similar. So why, like, are you, how are you comfortable putting this patient in traction versus a traumatic patient? Great. So uh, I go with the um, uh, condyle C1 index. If, if that's low, then you know that capsular, uh, the, the, the joint capsule at uh, the condyle C1 uh, joint is, is, is uh, pretty, you know, intact. You know, let me go back to the images here. That's a great question. So I'd never put a patient in traction who has an AOD dissociation. But when you look at this, see, condyle C1 index is low. Here it's destroyed, but it's, it's not dislocated. You know what I mean? So I'm comfortable putting patients uh, uh, with, with traction um, in any pathology except for, except for AOD, atlanto occipital dissociation or dislocation, or and plan to axial dislocation or, or um, dissociation. No, that's what I was going to ask you too, because the different situation here from trauma or anything else is that it seems like 
your bone is destroyed and your ligaments are destroyed by the infection, right? Correct. Nothing is going to be intact, like during or after when this person is even healing. You've lost a lot more support, Correct. right? Yes, but I think the instability here is less on the spectrum, probably is less than an AOD. Um, you know, I, I go by the uh, interval, the joint interval um, and alignment, uh, especially the uh, atlanta occipital uh, joint. If that's not really dislocated, I'm comfortable patient, putting patients in traction. Now, to be honest, I mean, no one knows the correct answer, but the thing is like, what can we do to help improve and you're watching him, you know, you're talking to him. I mean, he's one out of uh, five in the upper extremities and two out of five. You talk to him, you're putting traction gently. So we're not, we don't go abruptly with five pounds, then 10 pounds, and then C, and then 20 pounds. And he tolerated it well. Um, and the reason also I put the patient in a, in a, a crown uh, halo and not tongs, not only because it's by vector, but also I want to lock them into a, a vest after they're reduced. So I won't lose the reduction when I want to go posteriorly on them. Uh, because this, uh, there's an adapter that you can hook up to the crown halo uh, that attaches to the Mayfield. So I put them in a vest. So we reduced them, we put them in a vest, and we, uh, that's the lateral x-ray. Now, now there, I'm, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this sure. is Ali again. I think the point that you just made is absolutely so critical. I just want to make sure that uh, the participants, especially the trainees, heard what you said because it's absolutely essential. Part of the surgical planning is what, what's going to happen after. Are you going to put this patient in a halo? Are you going to, put the, are you going to position this patient in surgery in, you know, with that uh, halo ring? So that, that's, uh, that really uh, dictates whether you, like you said, you use the uh, tongue traction or the halo ring. If there's any hesitation, I would say use the halo ring because it gives you more options after, whether in positioning in surgery or post-operative halo. Uh, we do that a lot for, as you know, for cervical thoracic deformities and uh, basically uh, syndromic deformities. Uh, but that was a great point. That's, that's basically anticipating what's going to happen after. Thank you for mentioning that. Absolutely. I, and to further emphasize, let's say you want to do uh, a you know, you have a deformity, you want to go front back, let's say cervical kyphosis, you can use tongs, you know, because you're going to go from the front. Most of the reduction happens in the front, really realigned. Then you can remove the uh, tongs and you put them in a Mayfield. That's fine. But, but if you want to go from the back um, to start with, you probably should lock them into the vest. So that's the lateral x-ray. And now that's the CT with the crown halo vest. And you can see, once you realign, you're decompressing the spinal cord. It doesn't, it stops be, being an emergency. Still, it's an urgent situation, but it's not an emergency anymore. Uh, so before we took him, we took him the next day. I didn't take him the same day. I took him the next day because his exam was like four plus out of five in the upper and lower extremities. Uh, we took him the next day and then we locked him into this position. Obviously, um, you know, I see the alignment is much better here and here. Spinal cord is decompressed. The compression was due to the deformity. You reduce, you decompress. And then takes a team. You know, you got to do awake fiber optic. Why awake fiber optic? Because of an air, you want to make sure that the patient does not lose his airway. Not for spinal cord uh, protection, we're doing awake here. We're doing awake here for airway protection because he has a retropharyngeal abscess, prevertebral abscess, a lot of soft tissue swelling. And uh, if you do it asleep, you might lose the air and you don't have too much leeway into managing it because he's locked in a halo vest. So you do it awake, team effort, see everyone's like focusing and, on how to do it. And it was a smooth intubation, luckily. Patient's anatomy was not that bad. And then uh, you do the uh, OC fusion. Um, I have other pictures from other patients on how to, how, you know, there's an adapter that connects to the uh, crown halo that then hooks up to the um, uh, Mayfield, and then you remove the posterior poles and the posterior vest, you keep the anterior one. Then you can, once you're done with the OC fusion, you can put the uh, shell back in the back and then you can hook up the uh, poles to the uh, crown halo if you wanna continue using the vest uh, for a few days. I usually keep them in a crown halo vest after surgery for a few days just to kinda uh, avoid uh, a lot of pressure on the incision kind of keeps it protected. 
then I switched them day three, day four to a myelin J color. So this patient um, uh, was discharged to, uh, to home actually, <laughs> uh, you know, home health. Um, it was challenging because, you know, it's a pick line. You want to have close uh, contact with him so that he won't use the pick line for uh, drug, but, but, but he miraculously uh, had a really good recovery. Uh, so that's, uh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, I, I apologize to, uh, in, uh, for interrupting yet again, but I no, want yeah, people true. to pay attention to something. You have so many amazing pearls in these pictures. Uh, if you go back to that fluoroscopy, um, I want the, the floral picture. Yeah. I just want the, uh, the folks on the call uh, on the meeting to, uh, to look at the mandible, look at the angle of the mandible and look at the spinal column. Look at that space behind the mandible, uh, sorry, you can't see my, uh, my, my cursor, but basically that retromandibular space. And I'm gonna mention something about it in, in my short presentation at the end, but I just want people to look at that area and I'll get back to it. I'm not gonna give away the answer. Thank you. Sorry, sorry I, I, uh, I was like, I clicked it by mistake. So this, this area, correct? Okay. So I have a few more cases. I don't know if you wanted to continue going or you wanna uh, show your case, uh, Ali, and then, uh, Wendy, whatever you guys want, I'm happy to do. So this, this case was yeah, a Grisel syndrome, uh, just to summarize, secondary to a retropharyngeal abscess, C1, C2, rototory subluxation, secondary to a retropharyngeal abscess. Um, you want me to continue or I want to show your case? I mean, uh, continue? Yes, please, another Sound. case. Okay, so I'll go faster on this one. This patient no, is- Don't a, go faster, keep, okay. yeah, no, this is great. <laughs> okay. All right, this is a 56-year-old uh, uh, Hispanic man, suffered a fall from a ladder. He presented with neck pain, quadriparesis, dysphagia. Okay, dysphagia, not quadri so it's more than a central cord. On exam, he had an absent gag, cuff reflexes. He has, uh, his uh, motor strength was three out of five in the deltoids, biceps, and triceps, two out of five in the intrinsics, hand intrinsics, and then four out of five in the uh, lower extremities. So weaker in the uppers than the lowers plus absent gag and cuff reflexes. And he also, also hyperreflexic in the upper lower extremities and spastic as well. So since it was a traumatic case, uh, that's the CAT scan that was obtained. Did you want me to say something? Yeah, absolutely, Wendy. <laughs> okay. Please, please, please. <laughs> the, the, the same thing, you probably, um, so you have a, a widened, I think that's kind of a midline. Well, it looks like your actually your C1 might be fused to your clivus there, right? Is it fused? Correct. That's, um, uh, so that's I actually don't know if that, that um, anatomy might be the way he lives. It might not be traumatic. Um, probably no prevertebral soft tissue. So I bet that is his normal state. Absolutely beautiful. This is, think about it like a central cord syndrome, right? Like uh, a fo patient with pre-existing stenosis in the subaxial spine falling down, having upper more than lower extremity weakness like central cord syndrome. This is central cord syndrome of the upper cervical spine, which equals to what we call cruciate paralysis and pre-existing CVG abnormalities, atlas assimilation. And then he has clipal file, he has C1, sorry, C2 is fused to C3. Very deformed uh, anatomy here. He has a little bit of platybase here. I'll show you a different slide and maybe a little of an element of cranial settling. So this was pre-existing. He fell down, he became symptomatic, obviously an increased ADI. Oftentimes there's an increased ADI, especially in patients with atlas assimilation in the context of clipal file, because this, so the joint between the assimilated atlas and the axis, seeing a lot of forces, big lever arm above and below the atlantoaxial joint. So that's why these patients sometimes with congenital abnormalities progress with time because of the motion and uh, across that joint that's really mobile. So you have big lever arms, the head fused to C1, moving uh, against C2 fused to C3 about that atlantoaxial joint. So, so that's why the ADI can increase with time. And this patient fell down, already has stenosis to start with and became symptomatic. Uh, and that's the MRI uh, that, 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 that shows it. Uh, Wendy, if you want to comment. Yeah, uh, well, um, I mean, all I would add there is that you probably have some cord signal up there where it's being compressed, coming down, you know, behind C2. Otherwise, yeah. oh yeah, there's no pre edema. Again, nothing, nothing besides cord injury here. 
no soft right. tissue injuries. So exactly. So blood platybasia, you have an acute, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the angle here is acute, the clival, clivus uh, canal angle is, uh, is acute here. And then that's all because of his congenital CVG abnormalities, atlas simulation, clipple file, platybasia. Uh, so what would we do to this patient? So this patient obviously has central cord or what we call cruciate paralysis. And uh, what are the next steps? What, what do we want to do? Nader, just a quick question from the audience. Uh, Dr. Baisa wants to know, uh, does he have a, a C1 foramen arcuale or arcuate foramen? And would you get a CTA in this case uh, to uh, study the vertebral arteries? Absolutely. Any CVJ, um, uh, CVJ case, uh, you want to know more than less. So uh, definitely with, uh, you know, even with normal anatomy, normal bony anatomy, you would want to obtain a CTA uh, to study the course of the vertebral artery uh, because sometimes it can be aberrant uh, regardless of the bony anatomy. So absolutely. So, uh, and this patient, uh, I think um, he had this, he should have had a CTA uh, also to rule out dissection. So it's traumatic and you want to always rule out a vertebral artery dissection with these, with these significant traumas. Uh, but, um, but he didn't have a dissection. And um, so the answer is yes, uh, sure, we got a CTA uh, with any patient or an MRA. I prefer CTAs because you can look better how the, 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 the arteries uh, relate relationships with the, with the bony anatomy. Um, so what are the next steps? So you see this guy, um, you know, as cruciate paralysis, upper lower extremity weakness, some cranial nerve deficits, and this is all in the setting of pre-existing uh, CVJ uh, abnormality. What, what would we want to do? I mean, it's not an emergency, obviously. You can keep the maps up, uh, treat them like central cord. But what is the ultimate uh, treatment? I think, uh, I think we have Dr. Uh, Tan with us. Koi, you're there, right? Any, any comments from Koi? Yeah, this is a... a Tough case, uh, not a great case. You know, I think um, typically uh, textbooks might say um, uh, admit uh, with some traction, uh, followed by uh, re-imaging. And if there's a good reduction, then proceed to an OC fusion. Uh, and if there's not, then um, uh, OC fusion plus uh, odontoidectomy. But I'm interested to see what you did. Beautiful thought process, exactly the same. So. You know, we always want to avoid as much as we can going from the front, although it's not uh, a sin to go from the front if, if you can't reduce it. So, you know, be liberal with using uh, uh, traction. So that's what was done. So going back to this slide, you can see he subluxed a little bit anteriorly, and there's a little settling here uh, causing the stenosis. So it's not, it's harmless to try traction, even if it's chronic. You know, what do you lose? You, you know, if it budges, great. If it doesn't, fine. Most of the time, it will budge, especially if you have a big lever arm like the um, atlas fused to the uh, occiput and then uh, C2 to C3. So we tried uh, traction, and that's the uh, lateral image here. You definitely can't see anything here, so you want to look the, lock them in a halo and then get a scan to see if you're happy with, with the reduction. So this is the post-traction, and that's the pre-traction. And let's compare. This is McRae's line, if you want to call it McRae's line. It's usually from the uh, Bayesian to the Epistheon, but we're going to use this uh, line here compared to here. And you can see significant reduction. So the patient, and you can see here the anterior uh, cervical medullary region is not compressed anymore. You can see it. Okay. So are you happy with the reduction here or you want to, or, or you're not satisfied? I think this looks wonderful. Yep. So we're satisfied with the reduction. Actually, the atlantodental interval to improved a little bit, just a little bit, but definitely the uh, uh, settling improved. Now the treatment is easy. You lock them in a halo vest, and then you do, uh, uh, th these are the parasagittals. See the amount of distraction that happens here between the occipitalized uh, lateral mass and the uh, C2, C3 joint complex. So that gives you the opportunity to put something in there when you want to do uh, the OC fusion to, to prevent the, uh, 
recurrence of cranial settling. So it stays distracted and also improves fusion rates. So, you, so that's how it looked like. That's the um, uh, coronal view. You can see the joints are distracted, not equally, but they were distracted. And then you do this OC fusion. Uh, I could, you can't put screws into C1, C2. I mean, C1 is doesn't, non-existent, so it's occipitalized. C2 and C3, there's no bony uh, anatomy that's normal. They can put a, a, any screws there. So, you know, I went a little bit bigger, maybe a level that is extra. Uh, and you can put shims or a bone graft in the distracted joints to help uh, with the fusion and also to help with uh, preventing uh, the recurrence of, because they can resettle. You know, they can resettle, but, but if you do that, that would decrease the incidence of resettling. And he has an excellent outcome, this, uh, this person, too. Hey, daughter, uh, I noticed on uh, this case as well as the previous case, um, your occipital cervical constructs uh, both ended at C5. Can you talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of level selection, 3, 4, 5, T2, et cetera? Yeah, uh, you don't, you know, I usually, if... Um, I don't have a great answer to this. It's just, uh, you know, if, if this is like a long, like you have two lever arms that you want to combat. So I want to put multiple points of fixation above and below. Uh, bone quality plays into, uh, into account too. If the bone quality is not good, I go more. Uh, both patients had good bone quality. This patient, I would have stopped maybe here or maybe here, but, uh, but I took him down. So um, I wouldn't, you know, if a patient has uh, kyphosis to start with, um, meaning that his SVA is large, you don't want to, you want to, you want to stop down at the thoracic level, which would be, you know, but, um, but I'll stop in the subaxial spine. Probably C4 would have been enough in this patient or, you know, right here, that's C4, that's C3 uh, would have been enough. But uh, I just wanted to kind of obtain multiple points of fixation and uh, avoid, avoid uh, failure as much as I can. Now, in terms of bone graft selection, BMP. If I don't do a decompression, I would use BMP. If I do a decompression, I'll use uh, usually rib, uh, rib graft. Why is that? BMP uh, can cause uh, seroma formation. And if you have a suboxable decompression, it may cause a compression, uh, you know, uh, at the level of the decompressed area, you can get hydro hydrocephalus even from the uh, significant seroma that, that BMP may cause. But you can avoid that with a with a with a drain as well, uh, uh, like a uh, hemovac drain. But if there's no decompression, um, I would I would use BMP. With a decompression, I would use rib rib craft. <clears throat> Any questions about uh, this question. case? Can I can I ask you a question? So yeah. when you're talking about the you're talking about the grafts that you put in between C1 and C2, right? Mm -hmm. You. Mm -hmm. If you didn't, you said you could put them in. If you didn't, yeah, what would keep it from resettling? And if you had a shorter construct, just breaking the, the construct? Does that you know, happen? It, of course it can happen. And, uh, it, uh, you know, you see patients even resettling. You know, it happens with if you have, um, like, uh, osteogenesis and perfecta patients. These are the toughest to treat. And they resettle all the time. And then, you know, uh, so definitely can see res resettling in these situations. Um, so that's why you try to kind of, if there's a gap, you want to fill it so that, it, it, you know, it helps fuse and uh, decrease the incidence of resettling. Now, if it resettles a little bit, that's okay. It all depends on if the patient is symptomatic after they resettle. But anterior support, like support in, in, in that location uh, is, uh, if there's an opportunity to do that, uh, I would, uh, I would, um, Definitely, uh, I'm a proponent of doing it, especially if you're not going to go anterior and do a odontoidectomy or resect the odontoid process to prevent resettling. Um, so that's what I have. I think um, I have some more, but I, these are really the cases that I wanted to present. If you want to go continue, that's fine. I think uh, Ali wants to present his, his pearls or uh, Wendy wants to show us a case. Hey, Nader, can I ask you one question before you close out? Sure thing. Hey, when you're doing uh, putting in grafts or trying to fuse across those joints, whether it's um, condal C1 or C1, C2, 
Uh, what's your what's your graph choice? What, what do you like to use? Uh, I know um, you know some talk about just using uh, spacers like for ACDFs, um, things like that. Some will take um, other type of you know fibular graft or other things. Is there any particular technique that you like? Uh, you know, it's, I, I usually for in this patient, for instance, I did a cornerstone bone allograft, uh, shaved it a little bit and put it because uh, these are different sizes. So you know, and uh, you got to shave it and tailor it. Uh, some people use shims, the ones that uh, Atul Gowell and uh, Vincent Tronalis, uh use. I don't use those. I usually use bone uh, allograft, usually uh, cornerstone or some uh, uh, alternative uh, cortical cellulis bone uh, allograft. Yeah, and Sorry, when, cortic, yeah, like uh, yeah, the the cornerstone bone allograft. Yeah. Yeah, and then um, oh, how much are you actually doing? Because I, I, you know, I, I do the same thing, but. What I've noticed sometimes is that even with the axial loading, I feel like that's a, it's different from doing like an inner body, like a lumbar inner body. Like it's, you're not really getting a great uh, um, kind of like bleeding surface, you know? Um, like, what are you doing? Are you rasping, curetting? Because oftentimes I feel like it's just like a sheet of bone. It's like this articular surface that it's hard to really yeah, you, get into. Yeah, you got to make an effort to shave it as much as you can so you can get a bony fusion. Um, if you don't, that's okay as long as it fuses in the back, you know, so, you know, yeah. anterior support here and then use BMP or bone or um, uh, rib graft uh, here. I tie it. I usually tie it with a, if it's a rib graft, tie it with a tool of silk to the construct on both sides. And then here the opportunity for a fusion is not bad because there's no C1 screws. There's no C2 screws. There's a lot of bone that you can see that you can hibernate and you can, um, uh, uh, put a lot of bone uh, to help to help bridge the gap, but so yeah, I mean the way to do it, as you mentioned, you got to get through the capsule. You need to remove the, and which is a lot of work, and uh, not uh, you know sometimes it's not uh, uh, safe. You know if, if there's a, a uh, you know abnormal anatomy, you're not sure where the blood vessels are and what have you. Uh, so, but uh, but if you know structural support, great. If you get bone effusion there, great. But you know, so that's why I go big with these because I don't want them to resettle. You know, you want to yeah. you know, share the loads uh, at multiple points of fixation. Yeah. Sorry. I know Ali wants to jump in, but I'm just sure. going to ask one last question. Your thoughts uh, with hinged rods or versus uh, just contouring uh, the metal there at uh, occipital cervical? You know, I like hinged rods, to be honest. Um, uh, especially when you have an acute uh, cranioventricular junction angle. So if it's acute, this is not acute, this is not obtuse, but if it's acute, let's say it's 90 degrees, when you bend the rod, the contoured rod so much, let's say at 90 degrees, that would invite fatigue failure. It may break you know, because you're going to the elastic, like the uh, plastic phase of the rod. So I, I like uh, those hinged because you hinge it and then you lock it there. Yeah. Um, so that's the advantage. And that's, I think, to, uh, for acute, acute bends, that would, would invite fatigue failure. So I like those. I thought that the, I published a paper that's saying, yeah, it never breaks. Actually, I had those break too. And when they break, they break here. Yeah. If you don't get a fusion. So, um, but I like those hinge rods. Easier to place actually than contoured rods. You kind of put it in there and lock it in there without really reducing or pushing or pulling or anything. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much. Thank now, you. We, we've been discussing behind the scenes as you were answering that question, we would like you to keep going. Will you do one more for us or will you do present the rest of your information? Absolutely, I'm happy, happy to. Uh, okay. So uh, let's keep going here. So briefly here, like uh, CVJ 101, you know, anatomy determines function. So the, the way the joints are oriented determines the way they move. The C1, C2 joint is cup-like in, uh, in the coronal sagittal plane and hence it, there's a lot of flexion extension there a little axial rotation, while the C1, C2 joint is convex in shape, uh, you know, and that's why there's an axial rotation. The joint's function is axial rotation about the odontoid process. And these are the CVJ um, ligaments. CVJ are important for stability. So anatomy determines motion, anatomy of the joint determines motion, but, but the stability of the CVJ is, is drive by the uh, ligamentous structures. And sometimes you look at it, it's like, wow, there's a lot of ligaments. How can I memorize all of them? Divide them into four, um, uh, four layers. The first layer is the atlanto-occipital membrane. The second layer houses the apical ligament, thence to the ba uh, basion. 
and the alar ligaments on both sides, from the tip of the dens to the condyles on both sides. So that's the second layer. The third layer is composed by the transverse atlantal ligament, which is divided into the superior crew, inferior crew, and the transverse, uh, sorry, the cruciate ligament, which is divided into the superior crew, inferior crew, and the transverse atlantal ligament. And the last layer is the continuation of the PLL, which is the tectorial membrane. So that's how you memorize them. These are four uh, layers. And the ones that contribute mostly to spinal stability at the CVJ or CVJ stability is the ALR ligaments, which prevent lateral bending and rotation. Transverse ligament is important. And the capsular ligaments, capsular ligaments here between C1 and C2 and occiput C1. A lot of motion across the CVJ. I don't want to belabor this. That's why it's, uh, it's hard to achieve a fusion because you need to combat so much motion across these two joints. That's why it's challenging to achieve fusions there. Plus, when you put the hardware, there's a lot of gap between the bone and uh, that you need to fill so that you achieve a fusion. So that's why it's challenging to achieve a fusion. So talking about the ligaments and ligamentous uh, uh, importance in providing stability, this is a 37-year-old gentleman, motor vehicle accident, intubated at the scene, quadriparatic, had mild TBI. On arrival, he was quadriplegic. This is a sagittal and I'll show more, scan. So he's quadriplegic. One shot, got too much pre-vertebral soft tissue swelling. Even though we don't like to call it when they're intubated, but still you can tell. Normal pre-dental space. See, oh, looks, no, looks, look, so mm -hmm. I agree, it looks normal here. See, so that's why you wanna look at all the cuts. Look at all the cuts. So yeah, you've got dislocation there or subluxation of C0 and C1. Exactly. So that's an AOD. So you see, sometimes, you know, the uh, Bayesian dental index, if it's say that's more than 12, that it's AOD, but sometimes it's not. And if you look at this, they say, well, the, the scan does not explain the exam. Well, no, you got to look at the parasagittals. This is important because some of these patients present intact and you don't want to miss on this and then mobilize these patients and miss on an AOD and then they sublux and they become paralyzed. So and these, this is a stir image here. And what do you see here, um, Wendy? Yeah, so again, the first thing we notice is that extensive prevertebral edema, which we saw even on the x-rays. We knew something was wrong there. But it looks like at least, yeah, it looks like all of your ligaments are disrupted up here. Exactly. Apical and yeah, your atlanto-occipital membrane, everything. Posteriorly, I don't know. It's hard to tell posteriorly, but at least all the interligaments yeah. are. Um, exactly. And marked widening there of C0, C1, like we saw before. Exactly. So all oh, the ligaments are disrupted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So all the ligaments are disrupted. You know, the uh, capsular ligaments, apical ligaments, alar ligament, tectorial membrane, everything's disrupted. So that's what we call internal decapitation, AOD, highly unstable injury. No fractures, purely ligamentous injury. And the reason the patient's paralyzed, it's a stretch injury. The, the uh, spinal cord, medulla, the brainstem is stretched. So you see this, definitely it's an emergency. And oftentimes these patients have concurrent TBI. If the TBI is severe, then the head takes precedence first, but, but this patient had a mild TBI. And that's how, about how you- Dissection too, no matter how about- Yeah, he had yeah. dissection, absolutely. He had, this patient had dissection on one side. Uh, that's why I didn't instrument, C like we'll talk about it, but yep, he had the dissection. Oftentimes these patients uh, die on the scene uh, because of the stretch injury, you know, respiratory arrest or uh, bilateral dissection and a stroke. So that's the gold standard. You look at the uh, condyle C1 interval. I don't know, I can't move my mouse, but look at the condyle C1 interval. And if it's here dislocated, you have the diagnosis. He did this. Patient had full recovery actually here, uh, surprisingly. Uh, that's why I'm presenting it. <laughs> so patient had full recovery. Now, quick review. Uh, Occipital cervical association, uh, high mortality, morbidity, 20 to 30% of cervical spine injury related fatalities. So a lot of these patients die on the scene. But with, with better pre-hospital management, we're, more, we're seeing more survivors and we're seeing patients who are intact on presentation. That's why you don't want to miss on this. The spectrum of presentation can be normal, can be death, and uh, in, in between cruciate paralysis. Three types. Tronalis, type one anterior, type two superior, type three posterior. 
And there are many different ways to diagnose it. The last one, condyle C1 interval, has the highest uh, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, negative predictive value. So it's the best. But for, for historical purposes, let's go over these. Bayesian dental index, more than 12 millimeter, gives you the diagnosis. Bayesian axial interval, more than 12 millimeters, give you the diagnosis. Because sometimes these are asked about during uh, oral boards or written boards, so you want to know them. Powers ratio, what's powers ratio? It's the uh, distance AB over CD, AB from the Bayesian down to the uh, posterior arch anteriorly over CD, anterior arch to the opisthion. If it's more than one, then you have the diagnosis. If you have a superior dislocation, it won't be more than one, so it will be a false negative. X leaves lines, what does that mean? You draw a line from the Bayesian down to C2 this way and from the bottom of C2 anteriorly to the opisthion. And if the C, where is my mouse? Yeah, here we go. And if this violates the line or the dense violates the line, then it's a disso dissociation. No one uses these anymore because you can look at the Condal C1 interval, more than two millimeters in adults, more than four in peds, you get the diagnosis. More importantly, the modified C1 index, uh, Condal C1 interval, more than 2.5 millimeters, you just look at the parasagital, you get the diagnosis. This should be sitting on C1. If it's not sitting on it, it's dislocated, um, it's unstable. Uh, so that's the um, uh, traumatic one that, that I wanted to speak about. And, you know, this is don't be fooled by thinking that this is a simple Chiari. Look at the bony, that's atlas assimilation here. You do a decompression, patient gets worse, so you got to do a decompression and fusion. So you flexion extension MR, you can see that there's an anterior displacement of the dense uh, reduction here. Uh, sorry, anterior displacement of C2, C1, which reduces an extension. So that's unstable. So, so it's, it's not a KRE, it's, it's more than that. So it's tonsillar ectopia and the setting of, um, you know, triangle settling and, uh, and uh, clipal file. So you got to do a decompression and fusion. That's all I have. Uh, guys, thank you for having me speak. I'm sorry that I, you know, Ali wanted to present and also um, Wendy, but um, thank you for allowing me to speak and open for questions. No, thank you. And I think there's still time. Ali, do you want to still do yours now? You're muted. We're going to think you're saying yes, though. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Nader. That was... Uh, to use your own word, that was a, a supreme talk. Uh, uh, that was absolutely phenomenal. And I'm just gonna literally just take a few minutes here and, and do nothing more than just highlight, honestly, what you very eloquently uh, discussed already. Um, and, and perhaps this will complement your, your, your beautiful cases. Um, uh, a couple of things for me when, when I do these, uh, I do a lot of OC fusions. Uh, for better or for worse, but the two things that I want to highlight is know what the danger zones are and always have a backup plan. You may not be able to get a midline uh, keel plate. You may not be able to get C1 or C2 screws. So always have a, a backup plan uh, surgically. Um, I tell, uh, w when I do these, I tell uh, uh, the trainees a couple of things. Uh, uh, the, the most important of which is when you are uh, drilling into the occiput for your plate, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I always tell uh, my residents, I say, the only place in the body, if you will, or the spine, that if you get a CSF leak, you, it's okay to put in the screw. Uh, you can't do that anywhere else in the spine except in the, in the occiput. If for whatever reason you penetrated, you got into the dura, you get a little bit of leak, you can put a screw in there. And certainly if you get massive amount of bleeding from a sinus or the torcula, if you're too high, also plug it with the screw. Uh, so that's just a, a little, a little uh, a two pointers that I always uh, tell uh, our trainees is it's okay to put a screw there if you get heavy bleeding or, uh, or CSF. Now, sometimes you can, I would say 95% of the time I use that midline occipital plate, but sometimes, especially if you're, you have a, like Dr. Na, uh, Dottale, if you have a, a busy revision Chiari practice, sometimes, especially in young patients, sometimes there just isn't enough anatomy there to put a plate. So always be adept with uh, using uh, Songer cables. You never know when you need them. And, and uh, several, uh, several vendors have these lateral plates 
that you can actually wire right into the side of the uh, uh, occiput. And this was a three-year-old who needed uh, stabilization. So have a few tools in your toolbox because you may not be able to put uh, screws in the, uh, in the occiput. One thing real quick that Dr. Natalie also uh, 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 mentioned is C2 is from, the C2 uh, for me is very important. Um, I am looking at, uh, every case I'm looking at, am I putting in a par screw or a pedicle screw? They're not the same thing. They're different anatomical landmarks. Virtually always you can put in a par screw, but you, you can't always put in a pedicle screw. And I will uh, uh, go through that very quickly and, and, and show you what I mean. Uh, on the left is a two C1 lateral mass screws. On the right are, C, uh, are C2 pedicle screws. We all worry about the vertebral artery here, which is very valid, but with your C1 screws, you better not be deep and lateral because the internal carotid is there. The carotid artery is right there. So we all worry about the vert, which is a very legitimate concern, but be careful because anterior to C1 and lateral is where you have the carotid arteries. And of course, that's even more important if you do transoral or endoscopic approaches, uh, transnasal approaches, because when you're drilling the C1 lamina, uh, excuse me, the C1 anterior arch, the, the carotids are, are right here uh, laterally. Now, very quickly, uh, the reason I look at C2 uh, very carefully is because of this. This is a high riding vertebral artery. So this is a patient that I can't safely put in a pedicle screw. Maybe some can, I certainly can. I usually don't use navigation for this, uh, but this is perhaps somebody you want to use either a translaminar or a par screw. But if you don't look at this closely and pre-op you're like, sure, give me a 32 millimeter screw and you're aiming for the pedicle, there may not be a pedicle there. So you wanna be careful uh, with that. Uh, and I, I showed, that this is actually one of my cases from way back in the day. Uh, somebody that I treated posteriorly, and of course she came back, you know, with a very early uh, failure. You can see the staples are still in. And I showed this uh, maybe last week or the week before. You want to have a few tools in your toolbox. So this is somebody that I wanted the most robust C2 purchase I could. So on one side we put in a pedicle, on the other side we put a pars and even a translaminar screw. Just went all out on that, that C2. So it's good to have different uh, options. In the OR, you'd never know what that patient's anatomy will allow you to do or not allow you uh, uh, to do. Now, take, the, take a look at this, but, the, but don't be surprised. It's okay, the patient did well. This is not my case, but the patient did very well. And the first thing that you're going to say is, oh, oh boy, maybe they should have used navigation. We talked about this, uh, I think on Twitter, there was a few uh, threads about navigation. Yeah. Well, guess what? they did use navigation for this. These screws were placed under navigation. I love navigation, I use it a lot, uh, but be careful at the uh, CV junction. C1 and C2 tend to rotate a lot and move, especially in children or especially in patients with uh, uh, EDS or connective tissue disease, and you can be off very easily with navigation these are actually the cases that I prefer to use anatomic freehand technique because I feel the anatomy and I see the anatomy. So just be careful with using navigation for uh, C1 and C2. And at the very end, I promise you I'd show you this. I told you, uh, look at Dr. Dadele's uh, x-ray, the floral, and look at the angle of the mandible. So Nader, I'm gonna flip the, I'm gonna flip the, uh, the case on you here. What's your comment on this OC fusion? Hi. Yeah, he's uh, he's uh, he's fused in inflection, I think. Uh, so like this, so dysphagia and dysphonia is probably um, you got, you got to maintain you got to maintain the patient's uh, baseline uh, occipital cervical angle, which is the, uh, uh, the 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 line that intersects between uh, McGregor's line and the uh, inferior inferior so this McGregor's line with with C two, and the guy is fused probably to um, uh, inflection. So he's yeah. at high risk of uh, dysphagia and dysphonia. Peg two, uh, he can't swallow, he can't, he can't breathe. Absolutely right, absolutely right. One of the, one of the things that Dr. Dadale did very nicely on all of his x-rays, if you looked, is the alignment was perfect. And that is a critical, critical uh, potential mistake in, 
in OC fusions. So you, so, uh, you don't want to do what we call fuse somebody in bird watcher's gaze or a text gaze. It used to be called reader's gaze, but now we call it text gaze. If you fuse a patient looking way up or looking way down, they're going to be very, very unhappy. And uh, this was the patient, again, this was transferred in from somewhere else. This is the patient post fusion. And you can see the fold here. You can actually look at it better here. You see that neck fold? So when I do an OC fusion, I wanna make sure there are no neck folds. That patient has to be extended. So we took out, uh, we took out the plate. She was extended to get rid of that fold to have a more anatomic and more uh, horizontal, uh, horizontal gaze. So be careful when you do those OC fusions. You do not wanna um, uh, uh, fixate the, these folks in, in, in flexion or extension. So, so that they maintain the horizontal gaze. And what I like, just to go back to this, and this was relating to the x-ray, I always like to see a little bit what I call retromandibular space. I wanna see a little bit of air between the angle of the mandible and the vertebral bodies. I don't like to see them kissing like that because to me, that's another sign intraoperatively that they may be flexed. So I just wanted to share those uh, a couple of pointers with, uh, with everyone. And uh, Dr. Nadal, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, com so listen, I mean, if like you want to fuse them anatomically, you want to keep them as neutral as they can be. But let's say, and, uh, and the issue sometimes with pa um, uh, patients being fused in flexion, it's because sometimes you want to do a concurrent a decompression and it's tough to do a decompression in the neutral position. You want to do it in flexion, you know, sometimes, especially if you have uh, CVG abnormalities where the, where the occiput is horizontal, it becomes really difficult to do the decompression let's say a suboccipital decompression along with the fusion. So you can do the decompression and flexion, loosen the uh, may field, and then lock them in in a neutral position. Another point, if you lock them in in the wrong position, don't be shy to take them back again and fix it. You know, you know if, if you have a patient who has like preoperatively no dysphagia and then you do an OC fusion and you know they have dysphagia because of this, take them and fix it. Uh, Ways to avoid it, you know, if, if you want to lock them in a halo vest and test their dysphagia before and after, because that's the way they're going to be forever, you can do that too. So that's what I do usually if, if I'm going to deem someone to an OC fusion in a non-emergent situation. I lock them in a halo, I do a, a um, uh, test their dysphagia, do a dysphagia assessment, swallow assessment, swallow study, and then lock them in a halo vest and then have them walk around and see if they're, they're okay with it in terms of horizontal gaze and if they can swallow, and then you can lock them into that position. So, you know, it's super important, more than anywhere else in the spine to kind of maintain the anatomy neutral and the um, uh, horizontal vision appropriate. All right, that was great. I don't, want to, I don't want you to stop talking, but we're about 15 minutes over, so we better uh, stop. Thank you both so much. Fantastic, and now we're gonna have to have Dr. Dalit back to show my cases so he can tell us how to fix my two people. So um, anyway, though, let me turn it over to Quentin, who's going to be um, the host next week, so he can talk about his guest. For sure. First, uh, Nader and Ali, great uh, cases, and thanks to everyone who um, uh, attended today. You all make uh, virtual spine possible. Um, next week, we've got a great um, speaker lined up for us. Um, one of my mentors in deformity surgery, uh, Dr. Sigurd Bourbon or SIG uh, at UCSF uh, will be uh, presenting cases um, and will provide an overview on the evidence-based approach to the management of high-grade spondylolisthesis, certainly something we've all encountered in our clinics. He also happens to be an expert in terms of preoperative optimization um, and appropriate use of surgery. And so he'll incorporate some of those principles into his presentation. So I think it'll be applicable even beyond um, the treatment of spondylolisthesis. So uh, look forward to seeing you all next week. Thank you guys. Stay safe.